Today, we're very privileged to have with us Simon Gillibaud. He's a very remarkable guy. He's one of those people that I, I've, I've sort of watched and followed over several years now and seen his very, very remarkable ministry. He and his family, Lizzie, and, then, and their three young children went to Burundi in 1999, which was then the most dangerous country in the world, and probably still is, if not the most dangerous, one of the most dangerous countries in the world, and it's becoming, has become much more dangerous in the last few months. It's also the poorest country in the world. It's poorer than Burkina Faso. It, uh, of, it's about, about, the population is about 10.5 million, and 80% uh, are living in extreme poverty. 57% of the children under five are suffering from chronic malnutrition. And you can imagine living in a country like that for the last 16 years. Uh, he and his family have given themselves to the people of Burundi and to the wider area. And they're ministering, they're making a real difference in the lives of so many people in that re region, helping in a sustainable uh, way, 75,000 people every year, um, and, um, and hundreds of thousands of people have come to faith in Jesus through the ministry of Simon and his preaching over that um, area. He's written a number of books which I would recommend to you. You can get them off um, Amazon um, about living dangerously, living courageously in the world today. Um, and we have one in our bookshop uh, downstairs called Choose Life's 365 Readings for Radical Disciples. One, one uh, which I really recommend. I recommend everything that Simon's written because this is a guy who doesn't just write things, talk about things. He lives them out on a daily basis. And it's with huge courage that he and his wife are returning tomorrow. Uh, he and his wife and their children are returning tomorrow tomorrow to Burundi, and literally they're, they're live every day living amongst shooting and danger um, in order to serve Jesus and to bring the good news of Jesus to a people in desperate need. So it's a huge honor that we have him with us uh, on this day before he goes back to Burundi. So would you give a very warm welcome to Simon Gillibo. Right. Thanks. Wonderful. It's, uh, it's fantastic to be here with you this morning. I, I was just thinking back to, uh, I think it was 1994, the first time I ever came to this, this church. I've only been here a handful of times. And uh, you're not meant to boast about your uh, spiritual experiences, but it was, it, was, it, was, it was very defining. It was very marking for me, so hopefully it will be edifying for you to hear about it. it was the, I think it was the Capital Radio uh, carol service. I don't know if any of you around there, 94, 95. And and, you know, lots of stuff was going on in this church. It was on the news, and people were queuing outside this, on the streets because uh, people were excited about what was happening. And I came along. I was very open to it. I sat over there, and it was beautiful, you know, the, the, the candles and everything. And, uh, and I, I was like, God, I've heard that you're doing dramatic things in this church, and I'm open to them. If it's you, if it's not you, I'm, I'm not going to be a sucker for that. Uh, and, uh, and we were worshiping, and we were praying, and uh, my, one of my heroes is D.L. Moody. And uh, he had this experience of God at which one point God was so real to him and the fire was so real, eventually he said, stop, Lord, stop, Lord, I'm going to die. And that was what I had. I was over there and uh, I, I sort of felt, I, I thought it was a tangible pitter-patter on the back of my back and I was, I was saying, come on, Lord, bring it on. If this is you, I'm up for it. And it got hotter and hotter and hotter. And then it, it wasn't just in, in my mind, it wasn't my games, it was real. It was like on my head. And I was like, oh, Lord, I'm yours. I'll do anything. I'll go anywhere. I have my life. And then, and, then, and then it got so hot that I looked up and a candle was pouring down my head. <laughs> now... Um, that wasn't a real experience of God. <laughs> but this morning, I hope you can have a real experience of God and a powerful experience of God. As uh, I have said in the in introduction, you know, I'm, I'm going back to a very difficult situation. Um, it's in Burundi, so let's just have that up on the screen there. So if you didn't know where it is, that's where it is. And it's a country of uh, great suffering right now. If you roll through the next one, that's, that's been going on the last few months. Uh, these, you know, it's 100 yards outside our street, uh, barricades set up, people burning tires, people um, doing all sorts. Most of these, these guys in the picture, they're probably dead now because once the coup attempt failed, a lot of the people in demonstrations were rounded up and uh, a whole host of people have been killed. It's made a very poor country even poorer. 
And, uh, and yet it's a country that, you know, I've been called to. I was called to in the context of, you know, being wealthy from a privileged background, being in a good job, as a number of you are here. And this is the prayer that I want us to close with after our time together. The prayer that took me to Burundi. And by the way, I don't want any of you to come to Burundi. Uh, and I don't want your money this morning to disarm you. You know, you've got your own missionaries, you support them. What I would love is your prayers. And I'll mention that again uh, a bit later, but this was the prayer that took me to Burundi in a good job. I was like, Lord, I will do anything. I will go anywhere. And that's what he wants from us. He knows what's best for us. I'm in, Lord. I don't want the safety of existing. I want the adventure of living. Some of us, our highest aspiration is just to arrive safely at death. And there's, there's so much more to live for, isn't there? So in that good job, that was my prayer. And I, and I, I said, I don't want security. Security is a mixed blessing because when we're secure in of ourselves, we don't need God. Amen. Yeah. That was a lame amen. I think it was a lame amen probably because we do want security. We love security, don't we? But, you know, if you put your security in your house and your pension, there's nothing wrong with the house and the pension. But if your security isn't in that, it's idolatry. Jesus says, come to me. I've got big hands. You can trust me. So that was my prayer. And to cut a long story short, I was in this job, and this guy tracked me down, and we arranged to meet up in Bishopsgate in the city, and uh, I received a scribbled piece of paper with a, with a number on it, ring this guy, he's trying to track you down. I rang him up, there we were, and we met up, and I, uh, it was, uh, I just looked across at him, I didn't know who on earth this guy was, and he said, I've been praying, I believe God sent me to you, <laughs> he wants you to Burundi, be involved in youth and mission and evangelism, as he's talking, my heart was thumping in my chest, saying, God, is this what you've kept me for? So I said to him, all right, thanks, weirdo. I'll think about it. I'll be spiritual. I'll pray about it. And I went back to my job. And I was in front of the computer. And my job had nothing to do with Burundi. And half of you had never even heard about Burundi until this morning. A lot of people, what's Burundi? Is it a piece of cheese? It's about the least significant country in the world. And there I was in front of the computer. I said, right now, God, if you want me to go to Burundi, well, that means leaving family, friends, security, career. I was single at the time in terms of leaving family. Uh, Dosh, money, everything, going to a place where I might get killed. And people have tried to kill me in those years. So I want a radical sign right now in front of the computer to, to justify such a radical change of career. And so there I was in front of the computer. Give me, a, give me a sign, Lord, right now in front of the computer if you want me to go. And the phone rang. And I picked up the phone. And I heard this voice saying, do you know anyone who wants to work in Burundi. Now, what do you do with that? Now, either I'm lying to you, and I could be lying, but you don't, you don't spend six years of your life risking your life for a lie, do you? Oh, that was a coincidence, and that could be a coincidence. Some of us, if we don't yet follow Jesus, we'd have to say that was a coincidence, but I hope most of you'd agree that wasn't a coincidence, that was a God incident. That God, you know, there's that lovely verse in 2 Chronicles where it says, the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth, looking to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. And he's looking at each one of us here this morning. Well, he's looking at us. He's saying, who is up for it? Who wants to make their life count? And this invitation is open to everyone. And I'm only talking down to you there because, because of, you know, being up on this stage. But it's level ground at the foot of the cross. Please don't think I'm doing, you know, that I think I'm any better than any one of us. We, you know, we're all fickle duffers just hopefully giving it our best shot through our own brokenness. And he wants to use you, but you've got to pray that prayer. So last couple more pictures by means of introduction. So I've been out there 16 years on and off, and uh, it's been a tough time. It's been an amazing time. I think that's what Jesus meant when he said, I've come to have life and life to the full. He didn't say life and a long life or life and an easy life. He said life and a full life. He led a very full life in his 33 years. And I definitely thought I'd be dead before the age of 30. Uh, and I'm not, praise the Lord. But that just means that there's still more work to be done. Uh, we support nine groups out there. I'll just share you some stories about one group. So one group out there, um, it's called Harvest Initiatives, and uh, each summer, so of the umpteen things we do, umpteen groups, this is one initiative in one group, we send out evangelists. Last summer, well, the war kicked in, so it's hard to do. The summer before, that's 2014, we've done this for nine years. We sent out 1,010 evangelists, times 14 days, two weeks, times eight hours a day. That's a lot of outreach, isn't it? Concentrated outreach. Well, in that time, they did the Acts of the Apostles. So they got beaten up. You read about that in the Acts of the Apostles. They got imprisoned. Even in, in their cells, some of them led their cellmates to Christ. Uh, they cast out demons. You read about that in the Bible, don't you? They healed the sick. So just one story. One lady basically said, F off, we're not interested in your Jesus, as some of our friends might do when we bring them the good news. And you respect that, don't you? So, all right, easy tiger. Um, and, then, and, and then, actually, as they were retreating, this, this lady said, no, 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 come back. All right, come back. I will listen to you, but I'll only listen to you if you heal this demon-possessed girl. So essentially she was saying, don't just talk a good game, show us the power. And so they gathered around her, and uh, the whole village came to watch, and the team prayed over that girl in Jesus' name as different voices were identified 
and cast out in the name of Jesus. And that lady, that young girl was set free. And that lady who a couple of minutes earlier was very antagonistic, had told them where to go. She dropped her knees with 20 people and gave their lives to Christ. That's one of many, many, many stories of, uh, of the Lord at work. In that outreach, we saw 11,000 people come to Jesus. Over the nine years, we've seen 100,000 people come to Jesus through that one outreach, that summer outreach. Now, of course, you can be evangelistic on numbers, can't you? And, uh, and, and, and the parable, parable of the prodigal sir will dictate that some are going to fall away, but we're very committed to pre-training and follow-up, and we planted churches through it. And it's lovely because those guys, those evangelists come back. They're just young people. They're just us. And they just come back, and they're so on fire that hopefully the pastor's secure enough to just say, all right, just go for it. And they ramp up the sort of level of passion and zeal in the churches, and you go on national radio, and you can't deny a story, can you? And by the way, you've got your own story, and no one can deny your story. It doesn't have to be dramatic. You had no meaning. Jesus gave you meaning. You were broken. He healed you. Whatever it is, just share your own story. Well, that's my means of introduction. Now, we've got the verses, hopefully, coming up on the screens. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to briefly talk about, we haven't got an altar here, but I'm going to talk about getting on the altar. It's the start of the year, it's a chance to make a fresh start. I screwed up last year, you probably did too. But afresh we can get on the altar and offer our bodies as living sacrifices. So Romans chapter 11, uh, verses 33, there you go. And Paul, at the end of chapter 11, he's just talked about from 9 to 11 how it's not just the Jewish people, but all of us. Londoners, Hutus, Tutsis, Brits, South Africans, Americans. Malaysians, wherever we've come from, we all have access to God's grace. And at the end of that, read that, at the end of the chapter 11, it's almost like he's so full with praise. There's, oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Okay, so it's all about grace. As I talked to you this morning, it's all about grace, our response to what God has done for us. My daughter is named after a girl who started her life down a toilet. So there's my family. We're going back tomorrow. Next one. So my, girl is, my, my daughter is named after this girl. This girl started her life thrown away down a toilet. And the reason she didn't die was her neck was caught in the U-bend of the toilet. And yes, that's right. 18 years later, that's her now. Isn't that stunning? But uh, as I held her in 1997, I could not have believed that 18 years later, next one, she would end up our babysitter. And uh, she didn't die because her neck was caught in the U-bend of the toilet, and someone fished her out of that toilet. They picked her up, they cleaned her off, they got the filth on themselves in the process, and she was rescued. And my friend who took her in, who saved her life, gave her the most beautiful name, which before I had children, I said to my wife, Lizzie, if the Lord blesses us with a daughter, I want to name her after that girl. And that's why it's so lovely that 18 years later she ends up being our babysitter. Because my friend gave her the name Grace. And I love that name, Grace, because that's my story. I hope it's yours, that whether we're multi-emerging rapists, pillaging idiots in Central Africa, or very self-absorbed people here in London, we all need God's grace, don't we? And he reaches down, and he picks us up, and he cleans us off, and he says, you are beautiful. You're made in my image. I love you. Now, come on, live. Live for me. Grace. End of chapter 11. Grace. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern as well, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Okay, so I just want to say three things from those in the time we've got together this morning. And as I said in terms of praying, I would love you to pray. I'm going back tomorrow with an incredibly heavy heart. It's the hardest decision I've ever had to make. A lot of you are parents here. I've got a 10, 8, and 6-year-old, and taking them back into what is a difficult env environment is, um, is, is heavy. And so at the back, there'll be some sheets there. Please come and sign up. My guys have said, will you get people to pray for us? They're going through a hell of a time. They're hungry. Their kids are traumatized. My colleague Ephraim's three-year-old daughter, she wets herself every time she hears gunfire. So she wets herself 10 times a day. That's the sort of trauma that's gone on. And so please pray. Please sign up afterwards. Uh, because that's what I'll, the encouragement I get leaving tonight is no, there are more people on the team praying. 
Right, three things from these verses. To be a living, if you want a title, to be a living sacrifice. First of all, to be a living sacrifice is to live urgently. Look at verse one there. Therefore, I urge you. Why does Paul urge us? Because it is urgent. He urges us because it's urgent. He doesn't say, you might like to consider getting the altar. He doesn't say, how about getting the altar? He says, I urge you, I plead with you, I beseech you. It's a desperate word. He just longs for us to buy into this because it's urgent. Why is it urgent? Well, for us living in London, and I've lived in London, so I know what it's like. It's easy to get caught up in everything else and, and work is urgent and answering our phone is urgent and we lose the, 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 the urgency of of living for Jesus. Now, it's much easier for me to live for Jesus in Burundi. Why? Because if you're listening to shells fall, if you're hearing gunfire, if you know that people at 300 yards are getting away are getting killed, well, you know there's a war going on. So you're bound to live urgently. For years, particularly from 1999 to 2005, I thought I was going to die next week and next month. People tried to kill me. That was a very positive experience because You know, if you think you're going to die next week, you're not going to sit around for six hours on PlayStation today, are you? There's too much to live for. And the problem is here, many of us this morning, you might not recognize there is a war going on in London. I mean, comfort, apathy, hedonism, materialism. You know, those bombs are falling, and unless we recognize there's a war, we are going to drift into apathy. This news that we've got, and that we're recommissioned here this morning at the beginning of a new year, is urgent. Why? Because, well, what what does Jesus say? John 3.36, for example, says, whoever has the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son, Jesus, will not see life, for God's wrath, anger, remains on him or her. Well, that's pretty heavy, isn't it? Paul writes in 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 8 and 9, he says, God will punish those who do not obey him and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. He'll punish them with everlasting destruction and shut them out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of his power. Now, that's heavy. But we know God's heart. 2 Peter 3 verse 9 says, God wills that none should perish, that all should be saved. Jesus is like, I went that far for you. Come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. I'll rescue you. So God wants everyone to be saved, but our colleagues in the office, our neighbors down the street, the guys we meet up with the pub, we go clubbing, whatever, in the mums and tots groups, If ultimately they say, no thanks, Jesus, well, Jesus says, I respect that decision into eternity. Now, do you believe that? That's orthodox Christianity. And if you believe that, like I believe that, then that's going to infuse you with a sense of urgency. We believe in life before death. Jesus breaks in and gives you meaning and purpose and fulfillment and healing and restoration. And we believe life into eternity, and both of them extremely important. It starts now, that life to full, and into eternity. May we be recommissioned this morning to live with a sense of urgency. To, to be a living sacrifice is to live urgently. Secondly, to be a living sacrifice is to give unreservedly. To give unreservedly. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Now, Notice it's offer. Again, we can't be forced into this. You can't be forced. It's got to be our own free choice. And why are you going to want to do it? Well, again, uh, Paul comes straight back to grace. At the end of chapter 11, it's grace. Therefore, in view of God's mercy, that Greek word is plural, it's mercies. Share with you a brief experience I had a number of years ago. This man was trying to kill me. He came to my house with a grenade to blow me up. He wrote me a letter saying he was going to cut out my eyes. Was that a fun experience? wasn't a fun experience, no, but it was a great experience. Why? Because I think for the first time in my life, I consciously said, thank you, Lord, for these. Thank you for the gift of eyesight. It's a gift, isn't it? Ask a blind person whether sight is a gift or a right. It's a gift. And our problem here in this culture is that we live, it's an entitlement culture, isn't it? And it's all about our rights. And therefore, when we don't get what we want, it's an an affront to our divine right. And therefore, talking as a Brit, you know, our national pastime is moaning, isn't it? We're so grumpy. We're amongst the most blessed people on the planet. And yet, and so I guess that's, that's the biggest gift that Burundi has given me, the gift of gratitude. So here's a life skill. And again, you could, you could t- this could change your life. Two minutes right now could change your life. Whenever I'm tempted to self-pity and discouragement and poor me, I've got a hard lot in life, I just go through the mercies. Therefore, in view of God's mercies, get on the altar. 
And I go through the mercies. This morning, I go through the mercies. All right, just turn, I just turned this thing in my house. I've got 10 of them. And clean, life-giving water comes out. I don't have to walk two hours with a jerry can on my head. Mind-blowing grace. And I, I, I've stuffed my face at McDonald's this morning for breakfast on the way in. Um, I'm not hungry. I could have shown you a picture of a little kid found down the road who'd been eating rubbish on a dump for years, and they had to cut the stones out of his gums. And all of us here, we can read and write, apart from maybe the Little East. Um, I think of a girl in one of our youth camps. She stood up and confessed to sleeping with a priest to get three quid for her school fees. And you precious sisters here, you're saying, I wouldn't have done that. You would have done that. Because otherwise you'd still be illiterate in second grade. I'm not judging that girl at all. It's tough, isn't it? And we've got freedom in this nation to say, Jesus is Lord. Wow, what a gift. You've got 250 million Christians in the world that don't have that freedom, who right now are languishing in prisons or being kicked out of their jobs, separated from their family, even killed. Are we using that freedom? I had a friend back from China, and in his area of China, it was completely illegal to share Christ. And he said, he said to me as we were walking along, he said, he'd been back four days. He said, Simon, um, every day in China, I do something that should get me arrested, sharing Jesus. And he says, I've been back four days, and I haven't done anything to get myself arrested here. And his point was, was that, you know, he'd lost the sense of urgency in the, because we're free here, and it's easy to take that for granted. Let's use that this year. Let's use that this week. I just got another mercy, last one maybe, uh, the National Health Service. What a gift. You know, my pastor's 18-year-old brother died in his arms because he didn't have three quid for the medicine across the counter. Three quid for a life. That's sick and wrong, isn't it? I think sometimes God wants us to get angry. I've had that disease umpteen times. I've got three quid. I'm around to tell the tale. But go into pharmacy, chemist, see the drugs that you need, treat a very easy condition, no money, go home and die. And we've got this National Health Service. And we moan about the National Health Service, don't we? The next time you moan about the National Health Service, I want you to picture me standing next to you and smacking you in the face. <laughs> what an incredible gift. And God is saying this morning, you can, this can, it can change your life in view of God's mercies. Just go through the mercies. Go through the grace gifts of God in your life. And then because of all he's done for you, get on the altar. It's the safest place to be. Live, un, give unreservedly. Don't hold back. Now, I'm totally preaching this to myself this morning because if you're anything like me, you've got to compartmentalize faith. I'm going to trust you for uh, the finances, Lord, but I'm not going to trust you for my kids. Do you trust the Lord for your kids? Whew. The apple of our eye. Can we really trust it? Can I trust him taking them back into that? I'll trust you for my job, but I won't trust you for a life partner. Or, you know, it's a compartmentalized faith. And God says, I think I'm quoting, paraphrasing C.S. Lewis, he says, God can't bless us until he has us. And when we try to keep areas of our life that are our own, they're areas of death, and in love he claims all. There's no bargaining with him. I so want to bargain with God right now. We'll be on the plane tomorrow night and say, Lord, you can do anything to me. Just keep the kids safe. And he's saying, no, just Trust me. Get on the altar. Whatever you're holding on to, it's festering, rotting death. In love, he claims all. But the one who calls you is faithful. He's got big hands. He is worthy of that trust. And therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercies, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice. They're living. You're not dead. You're not killed. So it's your choice. You can always step off the altar and some of us were tempted, think we're going through a tough time. And I came to Jesus, I didn't come for this tough time. Lord, what's going on? And, and hang on in there, even if it's by the skin of your teeth. Because if you step out of God's will, because it's, it's a hot place of suffering, refining on the altar. If you step out of God's will, C.S. Lewis again, he says, step into nowhere. And I've been nowhere as a follower of Jesus in, a, in disobedience, and it's a horrible place to be. So hang on in there this morning. Don't let go. There's a, there's a lovely story of a, a bunch of ladies in uh, Kentucky doing a Bible study on uh, Malachi. And it's the third week of their Bible study. It was chapter 3, verse 3. And it, that verse says, He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And the ladies discussed that picture. So God's the silversmith. He's got us in the, in the furnace. And it's a place of burning off the dross impurities. It's, it's painful. It's hot. It's not a nice place to be, but he, he, he's watching us. Anyway, one lady wanted to get the full import of that analogy. So the next day she went and visited the silversmith. Do you mind if I watch you? Yeah, sure. She started watching him. And then after, after a while, she said, yeah, but the verse said, he will sit. 
So do you have to sit the whole, whole time whilst the refining process is taking place? And he said, yes, ma'am. I have to sit the whole time with my eyes intently fixed on the furnace because if the refining process is exceeded by the slightest degree, then the silver will be damaged. So she said, oh, that's good. So, you know, God's got his eye. I'm going through a hell of a time right now, but he's got his eye on me. And he won't let me be taken an incy-wincy bit beyond what's right because he doesn't want me to be damaged. And so she left and she felt comforted. But as she, as she was walking out, the, he called her back and said, Ma'am, he'd forgotten to tell her one thing, and that was that he only knew that the refining process was complete when he could see his image reflected in the silver. And that's what it's about. Where is it? 2 Chronicles 3, Corinthians 3, verse 18. And we who all with unveiled faces or reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Jesus in me, reflected to the world. And you know, some people, you can just see Jesus in them, can't, can't you? That's what I'm aiming for. The biggest influence in my life. And by the way, that process is going to take ultimately to glory, isn't it? Because we're works in progress. But the biggest influence in my life is from the, from the smallest, cute little people. That's my mum. Why? Because, you know, she hasn't got this amazing CV, that you, you, but what she has what I, on, her, on her character CV is so beautiful. She's patient, she's loving, she's grace-filled, she's, pa- she's, she's kind, she's self-giving, and, and that reflected Jesus. So please don't say you're just a mum. Plenty of mums here. You're not just a mum. You've got your little discipleship school going there. What an incredible privilege. I endorse that fully, having been the beneficiary of an amazing mum. All of us, we've got a role to play here, and dads, obviously. You know, Jesus wasn't a, a social recluse. He was totally in the world, wasn't he? He was engaged. And he called out hypocrisy, and he touched the untouchable, and, and that was beautiful. It's completely countercultural, in the culture, but countercultural. And that's what we're calling, called to be. And so that's the third point to be a living sacrifice, to live urgently, to give unreservedly, and thirdly, to be transformed radically. What does verse 2 say? Do not conform any longer to the pattern as well, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your minds. And then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And brothers and sisters, if this morning you don't believe those last lines, his good, pleasing, and perfect will, you're going to struggle to buy into this challenge. His will is good, pleasing, and perfect. And at the end of chapter 1, verse 1, it says, holy and pleasing to God, twice pleasing. You know, his will is pleasing, and we can be pleasing to him. You can be pleased. If you're giving him your best shot, he's pleased. Enough guilt. Let's live in that grace. But the J.B. Phillips' paraphrased version of verse 2 is, do not let the world squeeze you into its mold. And everything in our culture is squeezing us into a different mold, isn't it? The lyrics of songs, the lies of advertising. One of the benefits I get living in Africa is I probably see 100 adverts a day, whereas you in the West apparently see 3,000 billboards just bombarded. Every advert is, has got a lie in it. Every advert is saying, you need this to be sexy or fulfilled or whole. Every single advert is, is, is to make you feel inadequate without that product. That's, that's, it's creating a thirst and lust. Now, let's recognize that for what it is, because it's squeezing us into a different mold. Some of you, you literally will spend an extra 30 quid on a piece of clothing because it's got a designer label, and you think that will make you valuable. Uh, you know, you've got value because God picked you out of the toilet. Do you see what I'm saying? You have immense worth, that much love of God. You have total value. But we get conformed rather than transformed. Be yourself in Jesus by the renewing of your mind. You know, I've got friends who, um, they stop the adverts, and they talk to the little children, and they say to them, okay, what was the lie in that one? And what they're doing is they're teaching their children to think. We need to be on our guard. Above all else, guard your heart. It's the wellspring of life. That's Proverbs 4, verse 23. So we're at the start of the new year, and I'm going to offer you the chance to recommit yourself now. The altar is here. Some of us, we're just hanging there by the skin of our teeth. Some of us, we've been apathetic. We've wasted... Uh, the last year, you might have wasted a decade, but, but you know, God can restore, restore the years the locusts have eaten. Some of us were full of passion, was a chance to again put the marker on the ground. I, as I fly back tomorrow, it's again, it's a marker on the ground saying, I am in, Lord. 
For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. He didn't promise us an easy journey. He did promise us a safe arrival. I'm going to get there. You might never see me again. Well, I, 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 I'd rather live, to be honest, because I'm a father. My wife bought into this challenge fully. My proposal was, are you ready to be a young widow? So she had to be ready for it. But it's harder, isn't it, with the children? So again, I plead with you for my, for my prayers, but I'm just sharing that out of my sense of vulnerability. We've, we've all got vulnerability. But God has got big hands. And I can't do this on my own, but I can do it with a team. And so we, we do life out there with team. And you need to live life as a team, in a life group, accountability triplet, whatever it is. And you know, when I was doing theological training in London, 1996 was it, um, I used to cycle across London Bridge, living in Bow, and uh, I thought of Moody. I quoted him at the start. And Moody, uh, he was an amazing evangelist before the internet, before mass media, and he probably led a million people face-to-face -to, -face to the Lord in America and over here. And when he came to London one time, he knew he had to shake London for the, for the evangelistic impact to be felt across the British Isles. And I, I used to cycle across London Bridge and think, how can you shake London? But he did. The Holy Spirit in him, through him, shook London, and many people in this land were converted and their lives were transformed. Now, early on in Moody's life, he was with a guy called Varley, Henry Varley, and Varley said to him, D.L., Dwight Lyman, it's called D.L., DL, the world has yet to see what God will do with one man fully consecrated to him on the altar. And Moody, who wasn't very educated, thought to himself, well, the world has yet to see what God will do with one man, one woman. He doesn't have to have an education. He didn't have a great education. But one man fully consecrated to him. And he concluded, by the grace of God, I'll be that man. Well, by the grace of God, you be that lawyer. By the grace of God, you be that teacher, that engineer, that IT consultant. May we be that as parents, as grandparents, Maybe be that as students, maybe be that as school, college, wherever we are. By the grace of God, I'll be that whatever I am in Central Africa. By the grace of God, we'll be his people. And so I'm offering you a chance now to respond. And please don't think uh, you have to reach a certain level of holiness to be good enough, because none of us will be able to stand in that case. This is a chance saying, Lord, I've screwed up in the past. But what I'm hearing this morning is your truth. I know it's the truth. It's the scripture. You've been challenging me. You, you, I, you've been highlighting areas in my life that are not surrendered to you, but I want to trust you for them. I don't want to be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world. I don't want to listen to those lies. I want to be transformed because your will is good. It's pleasing. It's perfect. Lord, forgive me for the lack of urgency in my life. And this morning, I'm going to stop bargaining with you I'm going to lay it all down. Does that resonate with some of us? Let's stand. Please shut your eyes. And to me, this is always the most important part of our time together. Hopefully the Spirit has been at work. He's been challenging us. Please shut your eyes. And uh, we say, come Holy Spirit. We invite you right now. Why don't you open your hands? You know, body language says a lot, doesn't it? If we've got our hands full, it's like whatever. You know, we're not going to meet with God. But our open hands, it was Augustine who said, God gives where he finds empty hands. So, Lord, as I look at the palms of my hands, they are, they are empty. This is an attitude and a stance of submission, of vulnerability. And if it's true that you give where you find empty hands, Lord... Maybe it's hard for me to receive from you because my hands are stuffed full. And some of that stuff is okay, and some of it is completely impeding my seeing you more clearly, my experiencing you more intimately. So some of it needs to be got rid of. Lord, help us to simplify. Help us to recognize what's okay and what's getting in the way. Speak, Lord. Your servants are listening.
Lord, I'm going to stop bargaining with, you, bargaining with you this year. I am in. You can have my whole life. Jesus, have it all. I'm choosing this morning to offer my body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to you. This is my spiritual act of worship. I'm choosing no longer to conform to the pattern of this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of my mind so that then I can test and approve what you, your will is, your good, pleasing, and perfect will. So you can have my past. You can have last year. You can have the last decade. You can have the, the, the disappointment, the hurt, the, the damage, the bitterness, the anger, the frustration, all the negative stuff, the depression, the darkness. You can have today. And you can have tomorrow. You can have my hopes, dreams, longings, aspirations. You can have my family. You can have my parents. You can have my kids. You can have my brothers and sisters. You can have my, my hobby. You can have my career. You can have my finances. You can have my health. I don't want to step out of your will into nowhere. I want to hang on in there in that place because you are making me more like you, Jesus. Forgive me for bargaining. Forgive me for apathy. Lord, I choose to live urgently in 2016 in the power and the grace of the risen Jesus. To give unreservedly, no more bargaining, and to be transformed radically. By the grace of God, I'll be that man. Amen.